America and other free and open societies face crucial challenges and opportunities abroad that affect security and prosperity at home. This is a series of conversations with guests who bring deep understanding of today's battlegrounds and creative ideas about how to compete, overcome challenges, capitalize on opportunities, and secure a better future. I am H.R. McMaster. This is Battlegrounds. In today's episode of Battlegrounds, our focus is on Rwanda and the African continent. We welcome our guest, the President of the Republic of Rwanda, Paul Kagame. President Kagame came to power in 2000, six years after he led the Rwandan Patriotic Front to a military victory that ended the horrific genocide against the Tutsis. Prior to assuming the presidency, he served as Vice President and Minister of Defense. President Kagame has worked to bring communities together in Rwanda and lead successful economic development and women's empowerment efforts. As the 2019 chairperson of the African Union, President Kagame championed economic growth by promoting an Africa free trade area. He is the current chairperson of the African Union Development Agency New Partnership for Africa's Development, as well as their leader for domestic health financing. The African continent is the prehistoric cradle of humankind. The continent's history is rich and diverse. From the medieval to early modern periods, Countless tribes and kingdoms evolved and interacted as myriad cultures developed. In the late 13th century, the major European powers colonized every African nation except Ethiopia and Liberia. Colonial rule extracted resources and supplanted social structures and indigenous governance throughout Africa. Europeans drew state boundaries without regard to ethnicity or language, setting conditions for conflict. Weak governance and authoritarian rule that persisted in the post colonial period. The legacies of colonialism and interventions associated with geostrategic competition during the Cold War laid the foundation for many of today's challenges. Rwanda was no exception tribal power struggles, colonial exploitation, ethnic killings, and forced mass exile led to a disastrous civil war. The violence increased instability in the surrounding countries of the Great Lakes region and reached its apogee during the almost unspeakable genocide against the Tutsis. Ethnic Hutu extremists murdered over one million people. Aggressive reconciliation, including a multifaceted program of military action, civic education, local elections, and reintegration of former fighters and refugees achieved remarkable progress toward peace and prosperity. Violence in the broader Great Lakes region persists, however, as a wave of extreme violence in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo has resulted in hundreds of deaths and forced nearly 70,000 people to flee their homes. Further north in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, a conflict between rebels and government forces that has generated tremendous human suffering as refugees flee to burgeoning camps in Sudan. Despite those conflicts in East Africa and violence associated with jihadist terrorist organizations from the G5 Sahel region to Nigeria to Northern Africa to the Horn of Africa, this continent of 54 sovereign nations and 1 to 3 billion people is also the world's youngest. 40% of Africans are under 15, and the population is expected to triple by 2050. Africa is home to several of the world's fastest-growing economies, including Rwanda and Ethiopia. The continent has tremendous potential for economic growth, improved infrastructure and public services, health security, energy security, and governance reform. For example, this year's African Continental Free Trade Area made the continent the world's largest free trade area. Many countries have made progress towards the goals of Agenda 2063, Africa's blueprint and master plan for transforming the continent into the global powerhouse of the future, including those involving good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, justice, and the rule of law. While progress towards African peace and prosperity has been mixed and violence is growing across much of the continent, it is clear that in our interconnected world, Africa's future is the world's future. 
the cost of ignoring Africa's challenges and opportunities are vast. Emerging technologies, for example, hold promise for addressing interconnected problems associated with environmental protection, climate change, poverty migration, and energy, health, and food and water security. Problems that originate in Africa don't stay in Africa. For example, conflicts in the G5 Sahel and continued instability in Libya created a global migration crisis in Europe and beyond. China is using economic co-option and coercion on the continent to gain control of raw materials, such as rare earth metals, and gain competitive advantage in the emerging global economy. Many nations are facing default on large debts to Chinese national banks. We welcome President Kagame at a time when U.S. engagement with the continent of Africa is more important than ever, and there is a record of success to build upon. The United States and Africa have successfully partnered on many issues, ranging from healthcare to terrorism. Since 2003, collaborations through the U.S.'s President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief have saved over 18 million lives. Over the past 20 years, the United States has invested more than $100 billion in the health of sub-Saharan African nations, and despite reports of U.S. disengagement from global health, the United States remains the largest donor in the world to sub-Saharan Africa and a leading partner in fighting COVID-19. A new U.S. administration has the opportunity to work with leaders across the continent to overcome today's challenges and exploit opportunities to build a better future for generations of Africans and Americans. President Kagame, welcome to Battlegrounds. It's great to see you again. I remember fondly our time working together to strengthen U.S. Uh, African relations, and you were quite a, a help to me when I really needed it quite a bit. So great to see you again. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to join you. Well, you, you, we have a lot to talk about, Mr. President, so I, I thought maybe I'd just dive right in. You know, and, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think what Americans will want to hear is, is, you know, in light of the crises that, that we've seen across the world in, in 2020 and now coming into 2021, I think a lot of Americans are introspective about the challenges that we're facing. You know, they're questioning the degree to which we should be engaged in the world. I mean, I personally think we should learn from the pandemic that our world is is interconnected, and and we're, and and uh, I'm grateful to hear to, to your your perspective uh, to explain to Americans why it's important for America to remain engaged with Rwanda and to and to remain engaged with uh, with, with Africa and. You know, Rwanda, is a, it's a stable, thanks in large measure to your extraordinary leadership uh, since 1994, a stable and, and, and small African country. But I, I, thought, I wonder if you might share with us the issues that you believe require greater focus in relation to smaller countries. When so much of the focus these days, when we do talk about foreign policy, we talk about great power competition. But what are the stakes for, for the future of U.S. engagement with the countries of Africa and why should Americans pay more attention to the continent? Well, General, well, Africa, first of all, is the fastest growing continent in the world in terms of population and economy as well. So Africa of 1.2 billion people I think if one looked at that in its entirety, somebody should find that associating with Africa is beneficial. And for example, Africa and the United States, if they worked together, it would benefit both Africa and the United States than when you have Africa dealing with individual countries or ignoring them altogether. But I can understand where some in the United States come from. Af United States is, is a big country, it's a powerful country, it's very wealthy, it's, you know, it's technology, all kinds of whatever is needed. It goes to a point that sometimes people get lost into that and think they don't need others or 
including even small countries, to associate with, to grow, and to have the influence in the fact that people or big countries want to exercise, and that's what underlies big powers competition. So Africa or individual countries of Africa would make the difference if we were to have United States associated with Africa. But for small countries like Rwanda, it's very difficult if you look at Rwanda as a small country in isolation and not in the context of the continent. So it is difficult to maintain a predictable, consistent uh, relationship as Rwanda and the United States. Because within the United States, I'll give you quickly an example affecting Rwanda already. You know, we used to be eligible to AGOA, African Growth Opportunity Act. And then when Rwanda wanted to grow its textile industries, and therefore reduced on the flow of used clothes into Rwanda, some lobbyists, people who were benefiting in the United States from this trade, and by the way, they used the clothes, most of it come from, would come from China. And they were selling it to Africa, they have been selling, doing that, and they were selling those clothes to Rwanda. And when you wanted to grow our industries, so the lobbyists who were benefiting from this used clothes a trade actually influenced uh, the powers that be in the United States to strike off Agoa, Rwanda, so that we came under punishment for, for just doing that, for wanting to grow economy. So you can see a small country trying to grow its economy, its industries, and has to deal with this situation then there is a backlash and we have suffered for that. Of course, there are exemptions. In the past, we have seen PEPFAR that we benefited from uh, greatly and that's how Rwanda built its health systems. Uh, and even that helped us to actually deal with the current pandemic uh, because we established, we, 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 established those strong systems and we were using support from United States. So, but at the same time, United States also, and that affects Rwanda, is well, one of the two countries in the whole world that refused to use, say, the terminology that was agreed by everybody in the United Nations, referring to the tragic events that happened in our country as genocide against the Tutsis. And we have never understood why, because we even entered into arguments and said, well, if you are talking about Holocaust, you are talking about the Holocaust of the Jews. You are not talking about everybody who died during that period when the Jews were being killed under the Holocaust. So, but for some reasons which they have not even explained, they prefer to say, no, 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 yeah, you know, some other people died. We went into arguments and, but United States comes out, imagine powerful United States as it is, and is arguing on this non-issue that has been sorted out at the UN. We cannot understand what is behind it or who benefits from it. So this creates uh, an atmosphere of unpredictability, and that's how it becomes difficult for Rwanda, therefore, to predict what is going to happen going forward in terms of relationship. There is also I mean, this, uh, sorry. No, I was, I was just going to say, I think when the official word goes out from a government to go out and kill your neighbor, ba you know, based on you know, based on uh, you know the you know the, the these differences that are that are you know tribal or 
or ethnic yeah. or, you know, that I think that is a genocidal campaign, you know? So I, I think, you know, we can, you know, we could, we could argue about labels, but I think it's clear to me anyway, I think it's clear to our viewers as well uh, that, that, that tragedy in, in 1994 you know, you know, and I, I, you know, one of the points that you made, I think, is really important, which is, you know, for us to for us to be effective working together, you you need a sustained long term approach to the challenges Excellent. that we're facing. You know, and and you mentioned PEPFAR. I'll, I'll mention talk. We'll talk maybe a little bit about that later. But but what I'd like to hear is maybe what's your vision, you know, for Rwanda, but also for for the continent, uh, and and what's 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 your what's necessary for Africa to fulfill the role that you envision, uh, because I think hearing that from you could, pr could provide some opportunities for, for, the, for the United States to work together across the continent and with Rwanda in, 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 with a long-term approach and in a sustained manner. You see, if you look at Rwanda and Africa, we suffer from one fact that um, there is so much talk about sovereignty, but you find either we don't qualify to have these sovereign rights. Every other person across the world wants to decide either for Rwanda or decide for Africa. And therefore, the best thing is to let Africa and Rwanda be partners with developed countries, powerful countries, and Rwanda or Africa therefore decide on what we want for us, ourselves going forward. For example, and we are just reminded by this pandemic, when you find that countries are suffering because they do not have health systems built in a manner that will serve them when such a pandemic strike. Therefore, that means we need to build our health systems. We need to look at climate change that affects us. We need to look at growing our industries. And United States has a lot to offer in these areas to make Rwanda and Africa be able to stand on their own and strong as partners of the United States. So this, this is what you would ask any government, any administration of the United States. And I think it has been there for decades as we know it. You, you, know, uh, you know, President Kagame, President Kennedy expanded US engagement in Africa. Subsequent programs, uh, as you've seen over, over the years, have increased interactions with the continent. Most recently, the Trump administration's Prosper Africa, which you advised me on and advised President Trump on. But I think one of the most successful was one the one you already mentioned, which was George W. Bush's initiative, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, which, as you know, was aimed at AIDS, but also really a broad range of health security efforts that have provided millions of people with antiviral treatments and supported vaccination programs over 100 million meningitis vaccines, for, for example, in 10 African countries. Uh, the, the malaria initiative, you know, is, an, is another, you know, a, another great example. Right. As we fight the COVID-19 pandemic, and I think the world has noticed that Rwanda has done a particularly good job at containing COVID-19, what would you recommend uh, to President Joe Biden as the top priorities for working with Africa on health security, but then just to get beyond this crisis and, and to build a better future? Well, let me start from the current situation and maybe walk it uh, backward. The current situation as it is, here in Rwanda, we have managed to rein in the pandemic in terms of how we have managed it. Well, it was, has been uh, having lockdown when to, that is necessary or uh, you know, identifying people, contact tracing, testing, and everything has been done almost uh, according to the rule book, as the science tells us and the professionals have advised us. Now we are in a situation where we are talking of vaccines. Now, something else has come into play that we 
cannot understand that is going to affect us for a long time. Nobody in Africa, no country in Africa has access to these vaccines. United States has been rolling out vaccines, Europe, different parts of the world, India, and so on and so forth. Africa is still, is still queuing, waiting online, and wondering when these vaccines will arrive here. There have been many formulas used to see how we can find the vaccines coming to Africa. Nothing has worked as we speak. And people have come up with terms of uh, vaccine nationalism and so on and so forth. That is, that has a basis. It has a basis for, for calling it that. So the new administration would help, therefore, looking at how Africa would also be integrated uh, in this vaccine access as it is globally. But that is the current situation as it is uh, I'm referring to. And if we deal with this emergency situation, then you have to be requesting United States to look at, so how does Africa stand in terms of preparedness uh, to deal with the pandemics that of the future? So that means investing in public health systems, as in fact they did uh, reference to what you've just said about PEPFAR and other efforts. But this time more deliberate and more focused, preparing for things like what we have had or we are having uh, today. And investments from United States that grow the economies of Africa and Africa becomes a better partner with the United States uh, and everyone benefits. As I said, growing industries is to deal with the climate issues, it's to deal with public health in general. The administration simply has the tools and the partners are there waiting to work together with the United States so that we both can benefit and absolutely benefit. I think the United States benefits by having uh, strong partners or productive partners, not partners who have to keep you know, begging the United States for their livelihoods. Well, I think you make a really important point. I mean, it's, it's, it's really the right thing to do to take on this, this problem globally because it's a global problem. But, but it's also important if we're going to defeat the disease, as we see with this new strain coming out of South Africa, for example. You know, the, the, this is really a problem that has to be, that has to be solved all, all around the world. So uh, th thanks for that perspective. You know, Mr. President, we share military background, as, as, as you know, and, you know, I, I was very impressed as a, as a young officer of your story. You were at one of my favorite military posts at Fort Leavenworth when oh, you okay. saw your people under tremendous duress uh, during the genocidal campaign against the Tutsis. And you flew to Uganda, took command of forces uh, and 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 um, and it brought security back to your country after that devastation. And, you know, my experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan convinced me that, hey, it's, it's important, obviously, to defeat your enemies militarily, but also right. you need to consolidate military gains to achieve political outcomes that reduce the drivers of the violence. Now, you've done a remarkable job in Rwanda because you, end, you ended a genocidal conflict and ensured stability. And, and, uh, and so I, what, I, what I'd like to, to hear is what are your thoughts about not only how you did that, but what are the implications for insurgencies and proxy warfare that you see in your neighborhood, persisting in your neighborhood? And I thought maybe you could help explain as well. What, what are the drivers of conflict in the Great Lakes region? And what lessons from your experience might, might you share that are important to building peace uh, in the Great Lakes re region and, and beyond? Well, it all starts with um, governance, state structures, and how these serve the citizens. 
you will find most of these problem areas are areas where there are governance issues that need to be addressed. Obviously addressed by the people of those countries and their leaders and so on and so forth. So, but you would always find in the areas of uh, insurgencies, like we have in the region, that closer associated with those governance issues I'm talking about are citizens benefiting from or getting services from government or state structures. Are these states serving their people, connected to their people? Do they have the trust of their people? So that links well with what you have mentioned, uh, Mark Master, that referring to my own background. I, my family became, uh, went into exile when I was four years old and ran into the neighboring country of Uganda. Others went to different countries in the region and beyond. The product of that has a history. Uh, of that has history in itself which produced it. It starts with the colonial times and which colonial times only knew divide and rule. They would find a society and start finding ways to divide that so that they can entrench themselves deeper or really deny people to work together and cooperate. So when we came back to the country, we knew the responsibility first of all was to build the nation of Rwanda back to what it used to do to be even before the colonial times. But that is not enough and you cannot achieve it unless there are these, you are consistent and practical with these underlying values where you have the people, you think of their interests and what brings them together, what meets their aspirations, what improves their, lives, their livelihoods. Now, so when there is lack of that consistency in terms of governance that takes care of the citizens, and sometimes leaders serving in any strict state structures only take care of themselves and not the citizens. That is sure to produce some of the things we are talking about in terms of insurgency. So the way to deal with insurgencies and extremism and uh, conflicts is to create a situation where these governing structures meet and address the needs of the citizens. In, in which case, if that is done correctly, these groups that are there behind such extremism will actually find no place to live or to hide. And, and that's what we have been consistent with in terms of addressing our historical and the issues we inherited because we, we address and engaged and reached out to our people and listened. And we did not come pretending that we are going to deliver solutions to them, but we wanted and showed that we wanted to work with them so that we find solutions to the problems that affect us all. We, so don't we, we have always steered away from you know, having leaders as one group of people and then the citizens are there on their own to fend for themselves. Well, you know, Mr. President, you brought that philosophy with you. I remember when you went into service as the chairperson of the African Union from 2018 to 2019, and you sort of, you, you took that philosophy of, you know, hey, these conflicts are essentially political into that job and, and you merged uh, as I recall, the political sectors and the peace and security work, 
And and how do, how do you think, as you look back on that time, how do you think your efforts have helped the union? What remains to be done? What what role can the African Union play in this kind of peace building as well? And, you know, we have the incoming chairman of the African Union coming up, uh, President uh, Felix uh, uh, Shikedi uh, of the Democratic Republic of, of Congo. And I just wonder what, what advice you'd give him. How do you think, what do you think you accomplished? What remains to be done? And and what advice would you give the new the new uh, chairman of the African Union? It was uh, a pleasant duty for me to be the chair of the African Union in 2018. And therefore, uh, guided by that philosophy we're talking about, and many other things happening around the globe, the discussion among leaders of Africa, and which I happen to stress with them and they were all in agreement and in fact wanted so badly to get moving on this was to say if you look at what is happening around the world africa remains marginalized because one we have remained divided just as individual countries. And it becomes easier to manipulate one country and sometimes one against the other. And there are many actors who get involved in that for different reasons of their own interests. So we decided that we are going to come together, strengthen the African Union, actually make African Union not just unified but also effective and efficient in management of its affairs. And then that way we can easily confront the challenges facing us. And in fact, in even forging ahead with partnerships, we are better off as an entity of Africa of 1.2 billion people plus, engaging United States or engaging China or engaging Russia or Europe and so on and so forth, than if we just have to go each one of us. And everybody accepted and agreed, and that's where we are. In fact, that has also resulted into creation of uh, the biggest free trade area the African continental uh, free trade area that has been created, which is going to serve well Africa if Africa will trade with itself. Countries now trading with each other around the continent more uh, closely. And then Africa in this form of free trade area, working with the rest of the world, again, United States, or Europe or other parts of the world. And in fact, this has the potential to bring in more investments if United States or if industries in the United States, investors in the United States think of this big market they are going to invest in, it's more attractive than if you have to go dealing with the rules and the different things that are completely out of what we need to be doing with each country. So I'm sure President Sekedi, who is becoming the new chair of the African Union, and we are ready to give him more our support in the interests of our continent and all of us, has this in mind, has where he's coming from, uh, that Africa has already made headways uh, and strengthened the African Union, reformed it. I, I still have that responsibility to continue with the reforms as to what remains to be done uh, with the African Union. But the, the real aim is stand strong, be effective, be efficient, create productive partnerships, and no doubt Chisekedi will be assisted and uh, to achieve that objective for all of us. 
Hey, well, th- hey, thanks for that, Mr. President. You know, I, I think one of the one of the obstacles that you're, you're facing, that the continent is, is facing, to to realizing that vision is the growing terrorism threat uh, across the continent. And you know, you and I have both seen the horrors of war close up, and and it's heartbreaking to see, you know, the the the, uh, the terrorist activity from the G5 Sahel region to northeastern Nigeria to Libya to Somalia. And I, I wonder if you might share what is your perspective on jihadist terrorism in Africa, and what will it take to defeat terrorist organizations and 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 to to address the causes right that produce uh, some support you know for these murderous groups like Al Qaeda and uh, Al Shabaab and Boko Haram. My experience uh, and lessons learned, uh, I, I find that. It takes a combination of, again, it goes back to do these different countries where insurgencies, extremism, all kinds of things happening. What makes these countries unstable to be able to produce that kind of situation? It goes back to governance. It goes back to state capacity to actually do things that prevent that from emerging. So the fact that we have those trouble spots is an indication that certainly there have been many failures in our governance structures around the continent or in specific countries that are concerned. So, but the combination I'm talking about is if, if therefore it's, it's governance, but it's also capacity to actually confront them because these ones use arms, they use uh, all, all means to create this insecurity and, and instability in, in the areas where they operate. So they have to be confronted in that way, but not just this because confrontation alone will not produce good results even if you have the capacity. You have to go beyond that to analyze what are the root causes and address them. Most of them will be political or they will stem from these governance problems I was talking about. So we will have to find ways every time of using a combination of the capacity to confront these groups with the power of the military or other operations, but same time addressing the political issues that fuel these groups to continue to exist or even have influence because sometimes they have uh, influence on, on the population and they use in fact in most cases the weaknesses of governments where they operate. They say, oh, the, the country is not serving you, it is serving other interests, or it's serving families, or fa- serving this or that. So, and, and people start finding some solace in the association with the armed groups. Now, the other third factor that is important is cooperation. How do countries cooperate? Because we have found out that uh, most of these activities are cross-border. One time it is in uh, Somalia, then uh, it flows into Kenya or flows into Ethiopia. Or it goes as far as you know, countries in Tanzania, Mozambique, and we are finding all kinds of groups. Then you go to Central African Republic, you go to Sahel uh, countries, it's everywhere. So individual countries need to be assisted, whether by other African countries and more so by uh, the outside world that many times has means to, to, to provide to deal with this situation. Or in actual fact, some of them even associated with these groups. Yeah. Yes. They're, then, they're, they're interconnected. You know, I think... So. I think sometimes, Mr. President, we try too hard to disconnect the dots yeah. <laughs> and think of them as little separate groups because they are 
very, yeah. very well connected these days, thanks to the ease of communications and the ease of encrypted communications in particular. Absolutely. So then the countries have to come together really to cooperate. The security and the defense establishments have to cooperate across border and but the, the, there is nothing that will be more important than understanding the root cause of these yeah. insurgencies and extremist groups and so on, and addressing exactly that. You, you know, in the area of, of uh, multinational cooperation for security, you know, you, you, you've, uh, you've advocated for that in your own neighborhood as, as well. And, and uh, you know, there was hope in 2019 after Rwanda and Uganda in particular signed an MOU to normalize relations. So what do you, what do you think has been successful in peace building efforts in the region? What more can be done? Of course, we, we're seeing reports now of, of more tensions and violence in the eastern parts of Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, how well are your, is your local diplomacy going? Uh, to, to improve security cooperation in the Great Lakes region. Absolutely. Well, let me say for the Eastern Congo, the, the situation is not getting worse as such. The situation has been there anyway for now decades. It's just the, the, the solutions have been just touch and go. And then one moment things are calm and then, but the problems have not been addressed. So in other words, they happen in sort of waves it, periodically. It comes, you know, for three years, then another three years is uh, rare in the, you know, instabilities are along the Eastern Congo side. And then another three years, it is heightened, then it keeps going and coming and going and coming. So I think we need a long-term solution. And uh, the current government in, in the DRC, under President Chisekedi, who is becoming the African Union chair this year, uh, has been helpful in terms of being available and responsive and wanting to work with the neighbors so that this problem is addressed. I think that is absolutely necessary. And we think we can get uh, better results with that than we have had in the past. So that is on the Eastern Congo side. But of course, Eastern Congo again has to be looked at not only just as Eastern Congo, because it is not a, a country on its own. Eastern Congo is not a, another country. It's part of DRC and it's a part of the region. So it has to be looked at in the general context of the country itself, DRC, and therefore how it can come together and even assisted by neighbors and others beyond to actually address these that are called their own problems. And as, as you mentioned, the, all of these problems have, I guess, the, there's certain unique drivers of, of the conflict. But yes. while, while, we, while we have you, while, while our viewers and, and listeners have the opportunity to hear your perspective, could you just yes. give us your thoughts on conflicts a little bit beyond uh, the, the Great Lakes region, especially the one that's ongoing in, in, in Ethiopia centered on, on Tigray, as well as other places where you have Rwandan troops deployed, uh, such as South Sudan and, and, yeah. and in the Central African Republic. So before I come to that, let me uh, touch on uh, what has you alluded. You mentioned something about Uganda. Let me. Yeah, the 2019 yeah. agreement. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. So we, we have. Uh, you see, the problems with, between Rwanda and Uganda, again, have been there also for quite some time. Only that this time what we had and we hope uh, will help us resolve the, the matter is that we brought it to surface. We, we, we started discussing it publicly and openly. Otherwise things were happening, you know, uh, without necessarily people knowing what the matter is. So, but with the Angola and the DRC and then Uganda and ourselves, Rwanda, 
we sat and brought out these issues that have been affecting our relationship. And in that arrangement, we have uh, had a series of discussions to address now again what we brought out as the root causes. Uh, we hope that may deliver good results at some point. That's where we are. But those problems have been there for a long time. Uh, I, I will not go into more details because uh, I, I'm, I'm just on one side, and I don't want to prejudice anyone's <laughs> understanding of what the issue is. But that one we, we, are, we are managing. Now, we, we have uh, had um, uh, troops serving under the, the and, and both the military and uh, police serving uh, under the UN in many parts of the world. It has been uh, Sudan, South Sudan, one time we were in Haiti, then uh, uh, Central African Republic, where we are now. And we, in fact, as we serve under the UN, we, ought, we are just not peacekeepers there being told, do this, do that, don't do that. We also bring a bit of uh, experience from our own sure. country uh, during the tragic days where we can share with the people how to resolve some of the causes of the conflict as they exist. Uh, we make an effort to try and understand them uh, in those countries where we serve and also use our variability under the UN to tell them stories about our own situation and how possibly they could benefit from addressing their problems in certain ways. Whether it was in Darfur, in Sudan, then or in South Sudan, and wherever we are deployed, we work with the communities, with the citizens. We, uh, you know, and, and even the governments through the UN, we tell the UN, you know, if uh, uh, we could do the things like this as a UN contingent or force in, in any part of the world, we could help bring peace, not just to sit there and wait until peace is, I mean, peace happens and then we keep it because that's why some forces have stayed for too long in one place. They are waiting to keep peace that never actually happens. So can, you, can we contribute to actually making peace happen? Right. Uh, that, that is what we bring uh, in that contribution. Now, for well, I just, I'll, just say, I'll just say also, that goes with your theme of you have to address the political drivers of the conflict, right? Or else, or else you're just treating the symptoms. I think that is exactly the right approach. Absolutely. Absolutely, we do that. Then for, for Ethiopian situation, uh, I haven't known of AU or UN or individual countries uh, trying to help in dealing with the matter. It is still just within the country itself of Ethiopia. But of course, it is a very serious situation. It, it, it is worrying to everyone who gets to know and hear from what is happening there is absolutely one worry. So we, uh, at some point, there have to be steps to try and address that issue. And if it could start from within the country itself, so much the better. But I think the, the toll is just getting too high as we see it. In fact, the other problem is that uh, it has been cut off from the rest of the world. We, right. People right. don't even know much about what is happening there yeah. in reality, other than the misery and things we see when people have crossed the borders and run into Sudan or a few people who, are, who have been working there with the difficulty uh, saying what they have seen and heard. It's absolutely worrying and I think, I hope the United States uh, new administration and or the UN or others should be thinking of what we can do together with Africa uh, 
Africa needs to be engaged primarily, uh, but it's not as easy to say Africa is going to do this with this, and it's very difficult. But something needs to happen to prevent that because uh, by the time maybe one year or two or three uh, uh, elapse, we shall find that um, the toll has been extremely high. I agree. I mean, the, I think the, it has, you have to address these situations early, or as you know, they always, they always get worse and, and larger in scale. He, you know, Mr. President, I want to, I want to start talking about some positive things here. And you, we were talking about the, the challenges that, that, uh, that, that you're working to overcome uh, across the continent, you and other leaders, but you know, there are tremendous opportunities. Obviously the African population is the youngest population in, in the world. You, you, already, you already began to talk a little bit about the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, which has made Africa the largest free trade area uh, in, in the world. And so what, what are your priorities for economic development uh, in Rwanda? And, and what do you think the, the biggest opportunities are for U.S. investment in Rwanda and the continent, but also African investment in, in the United States and, and to kind of step up the degree of, of trade and and commerce in a way that's mutually beneficial? Yeah, first we have to really, um, look at it this way. There is what Rwanda as a country within our the realities and the size and so on can do with the United States. And for us, or with anybody, what, starting with that, what we want to do we seek investments, investments in building our industrial capacity. There's no country that would go anywhere to a level that uh, they are happy with without developing this. That's, so having this connection with investments and people from United States investing in our country and with us, that's key. And then, in fact, now the, 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 these investments have come to be linked with now green economies that have been talked about. In fact, we can now develop green economies with the new technologies that uh, I'm sure are more abundant in the United States than anywhere else when it comes to technologies of this kind or other technologies. So we focus on these investments. And internally, we have also been able to invest so that our people, through education and other ways, are going to tap into these opportunities that the new technologies, the green technologies, the other different industries that you develop, then they will find jobs, they will be uh, employed in such a wide sector. Then what we started with, for example, public health. In fact, public health is not just uh, throwing money to countries and saying, you know, address those pandemics and so on. Now around health, huge investments can be done with research and development and industries that actually uh, connect and build uh, and widen the public health systems. So this is what, as Rwanda, I'm looking forward to uh, engaging United States on. But I guess this can also happen widely across the African continent. Mm -hmm. Everyone, every country, as I know, on our continent is hungry for these investments. Now, what we have done that is going to make those things much simpler is this creation of the continental free trade area because it is now, because it now aggregates these needs of so many countries that have come to, to be in that free trade area. Therefore, the, the same things that I'm talking about, I'm thinking about in Rwanda are being thought about by another country and if therefore United States would approach it 
both individually but also across the free trade area, I think uh, the sky is the limit in terms of opportunities uh, between United States and Africa. And I think uh, the African, uh, the, the American uh, investors would certainly uh, find it very beneficial and maybe more the Africans ourselves. Well, President Kagame, I, I, I hope that's the case because I, I do think that you know, we, it's in our mutual interest, not only from an economic development and growth perspective, but also from a security perspective. And as you know, there's a great deal of need for infrastructure across the continent, especially to, to, to reach the full potential of the trade agreement as well. Uh, and much of that investment, as you know, is, is coming from, uh, from uh, China. And so I thought could, maybe we might we might end with a discussion of what we might call the dragon in the room here. Is that, yes, is yes. that uh, of course, much of that investment's been put to good use. But I remember when we when we met in in snowy uh, in snowy Switzerland, yes. Um, yes. we had just we had, you had just discovered that the African Union building <laughs> that you were about to become the chair of uh, the seat of was was built you know, magnanimously by the Chinese, but was also yes. completely wired. To, yeah. to extract all the data and conversations back to Beijing. And then, right. of course, there, there, are, there are other broader concerns about, about the effect on sovereignty and, and the effect of exporting you know, China's authoritarian mercantilist model. I, I think not to single out any country, but I think there is an example of Zimbabwe, for example, where, where China's um, strong influence there has not been good uh, for the population. So I, I, I know that Rwanda has significant Chinese investments. How do you balance issues of sovereignty and debt uh, with, you know, with economic and infrastructure needs? And, and what advice do you have for the rest of the African continent or for the United States in, in terms of, uh, of how we can um, compete more effectively against what I think we could agree is a, is a very aggressive these days uh, Chinese Communist Party in terms of the exportation of their model? Yes. Well, that's, that's a very interesting and very broad question, uh, which has always, uh, you know, exercised the people in, and their minds to, to try to get to the bottom of. Let me say this. China is present in Africa, it's present in Rwanda, and it is present in different parts of Africa differently how it is present in one part of the continent is not necessarily how it is present in another. It depends on so many things, whether it is uh, the resources they are interested in or, you know, uh, where they will go depending on the weakness or strength of countries, different things will happen. So much has been talked about debt that African countries have been burdened or overburdened by debt uh, from China. Starting off with this, I don't think China has forced any country in Africa to take their money to accumulate the kind of debt you may find with some countries, no. So in which case, therefore, I'm saying there is blame to be shared here, if you will. So it can't just be China. It can it would also be the one who takes the debt to the point, to the level that this turns into a big problem. That's one. Number two, I would want maybe United States or Europe or others to consider that if Africa, uh, if China is aggressive in Africa and getting its way, as, as said, and so on and so forth, what are the needs of the Africans that actually facilitate so easily the Chinese to find their way into Africa? Maybe those gaps, if they were filled by somebody else, Africa would not have necessarily to go to China 
to be choked with this amount of debt that they take or the mistake one may make in that process. So now it goes back to the other thing. How does, therefore, the West, how does the United States, how does Europe engage Africa so that they become a player on the continent and answer to the needs of Africa in a mutually beneficial way and that reduces on what is perceived as a monopoly of China in terms of investments in Africa. So maybe many people need to turn around the question and, and ask this question. So, but in the case of Rwanda, we deal with China. We deal with all countries, particularly we are friends with the United States. But we deal with all our friends across the world, bearing in mind our limitations, what we need, mm -hmm. and what we have to give back, and thinking about how do we remain balanced in our own settings so that the country remains on that track of progress that we need, instead of being taken one side or the other by other people's interests. I'll give you an example. Even in our dealings with China, they, they know our expectation and we consider their expectation. For example, you cannot ship Chinese and bring them here to do nothing or to be in offices serving uh, coffee or no, because we are not short of people who can serve coffee <laughs> in offices. <laughs> but if these are engineers or skilled people who are coming to work in industries that we need, that, or the infrastructure, the roads and other things, we appreciate that. But this has also to be providing employment for the Rwandans for the Africans. Mm -hmm. So you don't bring a million Chinese to come and breed and build roads or bridges in Rwanda. Uh, that is a completely different problem. So we, <laughs> therefore we deal with each other uh, based on consideration of each other's terms. And if we are in agreement, then you go along. And that should, by the way, apply to any other person we engage or who makes the kinds of investments with us. Yes. For example, in terms of debt, people talk so much about the debt of China uh, accumulating and creating problems for Africans, but there is a debt accumulated through the Paris Club arrangement. So people don't talk about that. Debt is debt. How it burdens you, it doesn't matter whether it is Chinese or European or right. United States. And I think also, you know, it's as you said, it goes back to good governance, right? And it's it's uh, the question is what strings are attached to that debt, and to have strong governments in place that yes. can protect their sovereignty. You know, when I when I when some of our our friends around the world say. Hey, don't ask us to choose right between Washington and Beijing. I often right. respond, "Hey, it's not a choice between Washington yeah. and Beijing. It's a it's a choice between sovereignty and servitude, right?" And so, let yeah. what the United States should do is help countries make the decision in favor of their sovereignty, right? And and uh, and I, and I think that you know not all Chinese investments bad, right? Uh, but but a lot of it, as you know, in in, in some countries, comes with some yeah. strings strings attached to it. <laughs> And some expectations. That Absolutely, that may be true. Yeah. In fact, but though there are strings attached in different ways, uh, even with others, apart from China, 
the, the, the strings attached come in the form of control. We, 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 know, we, we experience that. You know? over, over fiscal policy and, and monetary thing. policy and so forth. Yeah. Oh, yes, if, even cross the line and want to govern your country. Sometimes they even want to choose who should be the leader of that country. <laughs> this is not from China. I'm talking about uh, <laughs> now the other people who <laughs> seem to say they do things right. You know? Yeah. In fact, it's important to know how to, the feelings of people, I, I'll tell you from my own side. You see, the experience over the years and when there is this interaction, some of the friends we deal with in the West, they come with this mindset that, you know, Africa is indifferent to human rights, to democracy, to freedom. So they come to do it for us. Yeah. <laughs> or, or to tell you that you should be doing it on their demands. Mm -hmm. And we are saying, no, we as human beings, no, no human being anywhere would want to live by dictates from somebody else. Right. My understanding is, no, we are all human beings. We, we you know, those <laughs> who believe in, the, in the God <laughs> and the creation, <laughs> they know we are all human beings. So there is no way anybody, I can allow anybody to lower my uh, values to that level that they are only there because they are around guiding me <laughs> to, to realize them or for my people. Absolutely not. It's, it's, um, and this is a problem. It's, it has nothing to do with, but this kind of control comes with you know, they give you this. Oh, I have given you that. You know, I gave you money for development. I did this. So you know, then <laughs> I'm, I'm just telling you, it's not uh, theoretical. It's not, uh, it's an experience. Yeah. Yes. So we need to address this uh, very honestly and openly with those problems with China. They are there. And we need to address different problems with others as well because they are there and we well, live well, them I, every day yes well i can't think of a, of a better way to conclude this because you know the, as i mentioned to you when we talked before you know the purpose of this uh, of this series is is to develop what we're calling strategic empathy the ability yeah. to see the world to see the challenges and opportunities we're facing from the perspective of others and i can't think of a, of a better session than the one we've had today and, and uh, uh, Mr. President, th thank you on, on behalf of the Hoover Institution. Thank you for a wonderful discussion, uh, an insightful discussion uh, that I think will help us understand better how to build a better future for generations to come. So I'd like to just give you the, the last word as we, as we conclude. Well, much appreciated, uh, General McMaster. And uh, uh, I am here, I think I thank you for the questions, questions you raised. They, they are very pertinent, they affect the world, they affect Rwanda, they affect all of us. And uh, I'm very happy for this kind of engagement and uh, I wanted to tell you anytime you, you want us to have a discussion on anything or the people in the Hoover Institution, just know that I'm available and uh, I'm your friend, and uh, we, we, we can keep working together. We may not, we, we will not address uh, world problems, but we can make a dent, uh, <laughs> at least in terms of challenging people's minds to, to think beyond what is ordinary and what they are used to. <laughs> hey, well, thank you so much, Mr. President. If we all make a dent, you know, it'll add up. <laughs> yes. thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. What, what a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Battlegrounds is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society. For more information about our work, to hear more of our podcasts, 
or view our video content, please visit hoover.org.